and um, make questions at the end, unless it's really burning desire to put your hand up. Yeah, okay. I mean, I've, I've, well, I've got a short thing that I wanted to maybe start with, which is, I guess, on the concept of, of utopia and specifically Thomas More's utopia, um, particularly in relation to thinking about like feminist utopias. So it's not, it's kind of, it is related to the question of temporality and, and the future, but I suppose it's thinking about more, more I guess, theoretically or literarily about images of what that might mean, I suppose. Because mm-hmm. okay. I think that's part, part of the, the question, really. It's kind of, there's this stumbling block about how do we um, even begin to think about not just alternative histories, but alternative futures or even the present, because, you know, things are so... <laughs> Heavy, yeah, in a certain sense, you know, it's, it's hard to imagine how things could could have been otherwise. I suppose so. It's a, it's a particular kind of tense, you know, when we think about like the future perfect, you know, like um, you know, it will have been, right? But there's also this kind of negative version of that, but we can't necessarily, I don't know, we can't imagine how things could have been other than what they were in a certain way, we, you know. I don't know. <coughs> but, um, anyway, well, thank you for inviting me to speak, and I'm very happy to speak with Victoria, whose work I admire a lot. And, yeah, so what I think I'm going to do is, is read out the first bit um, on Thomas More and Utopia, and then just speak more freely about what I think some of the issues around time are now, and who owns time, Ooh, basically. Yeah. <laughs> Might be a bit more like, speculative at the end, well, I'm speculative, I'm a philosopher, but I can't really do anything else. Um, Okay, so, in Moore's Utopia, which celebrated its 500th birthday last year, um, we were invited to think about what communism might look like. Okay, so it's a kind of, you know, it is a, it is a book of, about communism, and, it, and obviously, really, our idea of utopia in a sense is kind of hugely shaped by, by Thomas More. Um, so, but this is a communism that includes slavery, the use of mercenaries in war, and the death penalty for adultery. Um, this is communism in the pre-Marxist sense, where resources and work are um, equally shared, where money, poverty and private property has been abolished, and where the life of the mind is heralded as the pinnacle of human existence. Um, it's a curiously platonic kind of communism where toilet pots are made of gold, so little do the inhabitants of Utopia <coughs> care for it, so they, they keep their gold in their toilets, well, as their toilets. <laughs> um, and people get up before dawn to attend lectures. Um, <laughs> like today. Right. <laughs> In this austere world, people are nevertheless generous, healthy, and happy. No one is poor there, writes more. There are no beggars, and though no one owns anything, everyone is rich. But like all places that exist precisely nowhere, it's not clear how we are to take Moore's proposal as whimsy, a serious suggestion, or a satire. We need a way into his curious commonwealth, a perspective that cuts through and reveals the distance, not only between Moore's time 500 years ago and ours, but between Moore's ideas and the world in which he wrote them. Thinking specifically about the role of women in Moore's utopia, their position then and their position now, allows us to shine a light on these distances and to think about what a true feminist utopia might look like. What would a world where women were not defined by men be? Or where women are not defined by men? put were in sort of, yeah, again, this problem of tenses, where women are not defined by men. In a sense, this is one of the hardest things to imagine, because there are so few resources for it, and I suppose that, that's my starting point. When Simone de Beauvoir declared women to be the second sex, she wanted it to be understood that women have never been able to position themselves, um, you know, in an autonomous way, in a kind of, uh, yeah, self-standing or freestanding way, um, because, you know, this kind of historical implication, the kind of uh, constant separating off of women from one another um, through patriarchy and pre-patriarchy. Um, because in a sense, that, that possibility has always been closed off. Women are property, their reproductive capacities are police, their sexuality is judged to be too much or too little, their education is granted grudgingly. And um, think about, we would just mentioned Wollstonecraft earlier, and you know, this, this idea of Precisely, you know, and it's a very interesting way Wollstonecraft puts it, where she says, look, it's a kind of wager, it's a kind of bet. She says, if we really are, you know, crap, <laughs> if we really are then like, frivolous, stupid beings, then give us education, and, and if, we're, if we are like that, we'll fail. You know, she, so she puts it in the form of a, a challenge or a bet, and it's so interesting that this is a kind of rhetorical device. You know, how do we trick history, or how do we say, you know, 
you know, play off history against itself. You know, I'm, I'm very interested in this as a kind of tactic. Um, you know, so their education is granted gradually and is still not granted at all in some places. What it might mean to be a woman is yet unknown, even now, 500 years after Moore. So what does Moore, or rather his um, explorer, um, Heifleday, I don't know how you pronounce it, but it's a kind of made up Greek name, which means nonsense peddler. He's the, he's the explorer of the island in, in, um, in Moore's book. Um, so what does he say about the women of Utopia? Every woman is a worker, and each is taught a trade. The women are taught the lighter crafts in the, described in the book, such as working with wool and linen. Both men and women farm, and both are educated. The sexes are equally and vigorously trained for war, though most of the time the utopians prefer to pay mercenaries to do their dirty work. Women can also attend the early morning lectures. So far, so egalitarian. On the other hand, it is the women in the book who move to their husbands' households when they marry. So, the, I guess the question of kin and the role of women in kind of kinship relations as a you know kind of uh, form of property and exchange. Um, and they act as servants, to use Moore's word, um, to their husbands. They are also primarily responsible for childcare and cooking. On top of the labour, they do a scenario that seems curiously familiar. Though in Utopia, capital U, <laughs> the labour part is never too onerous or lengthy, as there is no need to work more to provide more than is necessary. Hence, the kind of austere, very like, minimal image of the world. So, as well as the double burden, women are perceived also to be weaker. On the odd trip out of the city, for which permission is needed, if women are present, then a public slave. Moore's words, who drives the oxen powered wagon is used. Um, but groups of men alone simply dispense with the transport and go by foot. In intimate matters, premarital sex is banned, and both men and women are brutally punished for it. A strangely explicit ceremony ne ne nonetheless takes place before the wedding day, where, quote, whether she be widow or virgin, the woman is shown naked before their betrothed. The men are too, as well. As Moore puts it, when men go to buy a colt, where they are risking only a little money, they are so cautious that, though the animal is almost bare, they won't close the deal until saddle and blanket have been taken off, lest there be a hidden sore underneath. <laughs> Lovely. Um, <laughs> no one, not even the kindest utopian, wants a woman with syphilis. Um, <laughs> that's too early. <laughs> Okay, very occasionally, uh, women are allowed to become priests of their heterodox panpsychist uh, pan religion, uh, but only a widow of advanced years is ever chosen, it doesn't happen often. So Moore's mixture of Platonic, <coughs> Aristotelian and humanist ideas um, construct a commonwealth that is fair but differentiated. Women can work, fight and learn, but they are still weaker and must orient themselves towards the domestic and act as servants to their husbands. Nevertheless, in some respects, Moore's vision is more pro progressive than today, where women's education is still seen as secondary in some countries. Women are barred from certain military duties, but I think everyone should be barred from all military duties, um, and, and are still not allowed to be priests in the Catholic and many other faiths. Uh, but there are some equalities worth fighting for more than others, perhaps. Um, at the end of the book, Moore, the narrator, in conversation with his own narrator, um, Hyde the Day, suggests that there is a single reason that non-utopians, that is to say us, the readers, have failed to follow in their footsteps. Pride. Pride is described by Moore as, quote, measuring her prosperity not by what she has, but by what others lack. Pride is a serpent from hell that twines itself around the hearts of men, acting like a suckfish. But is, is it really convention to gender sins in this way? And why is it that pride is a woman? Why are the men of earthly commonwealths held back by feminized sin? And we can obviously think about this in relation to the, to the Bible and, and many other myths and narratives about where, where sin resides. Um, must men always blame women for their worst excesses? Um, and I think this is kind of interesting to think about in terms of, you know, maybe it seems tangential, but some of the debates around kind of visual images, particularly around selfies, and this question of narcissism, where, you know, in a sense, the entirety of our history is kind of, you know, men, you know, using images of women to kind of reflect back their own desires, but the moment kind of women do it themselves, it's somehow, you know, this, you know, monstrous, uh, narcissistic thing. So what utopia then can we imagine if our no place, which is what the word means, was understood from the standpoint of women, 
and not just as the sex defined always in relation to men. Would the men disappear, as they almost do in Charlotte Perkins Gilman's 1915 Herland, which is, you know, the sense, the, I guess the, I mean, problematic in many ways, but attempt to think about a world without men, if you like, what, what would it mean to have a kind of feminist, you know, female, entirely female utopia? Um, or would we imagine taking equality to extremes and levelling the biological playing fields via technology, outsourcing birth to machines, and freeing women from the labour of reproduction, like Shula Myth Firestone's 1970 um, techno futurist vision in the dialectic of sex, you know, where she makes this, you know, I guess now quite familiar argument that, in a sense, sex class is comes before economic class. You know, so she's trying to say that Marx and Engels are kind of right, and Freud is kind of right, but they don't go deep enough. That actually the fundamental kind of split in the entirety of human history is. Um, the uh, unequal biological relationship between men and women, and that it's technology that will, uh, yeah, level the playing field, to use, to use that phrase. Um, and there's a kind of ambivalence in the book between whether it's the technology that will kind of inaugurate a social revolution, or whether you need a kind of social revolution first for the technology to be kind of purposed in this way. I mean, I'm, I'm very critical of, of Firestone's um, book, as many people are. But I think we have to kind of acknowledge it as a sort of arising speculative thought, you know, a way of thinking about um, the future and, you know, the role of technology. And, and some of these debates are, are obviously very pertinent, you know. I mean, there are always kind of debates around, you know, artificial wombs. But even before that, I mean, reproductive technology in, in terms of IVF and, and the pill, you know, have changed things fundamentally for... for many people, many women, um, and I think it's interesting to, to ask kind of difficult questions about <coughs> how they have and, and, you know, how can we have a kind of dialectical or balanced um, understanding of what those technologies have allowed and what they might mean for the future, I suppose. I just want to mention that as another kind of, yeah, image of techno-futurism, I suppose. Um, would it simply be to imagine the possibility of women defining themselves as existential subjects and thinking about what a sort of kind of purely sort of female defined future might be? Condemned to be free by the human condition, but not trapped in unfreedom by the patriarchy. And this is what de Beauvoir really uh, ends up, the position she ends up with in the second sex, um, is a kind of, you know, the book is a kind of increasingly angry and amazing. History, you know, she looks at history, myth, religion, psychoanalysis, Marxist, Marxism, and they're all kind of, they all fail to grasp, in a sense, the sort of specificity of the way in which women are othered constantly, um, you know, and, and our positions as, as the second sex. But in a way, her solution, if you like, is to, is to imagine this kind of self-grounding, this kind of, yeah, existential freedom of being condemned to be free, you know, without those kind of shackles, without the sort of shackles of history, you know, and that's her image of the future, um, in a way, even though she's very critical of Sartre for kind of presupposing, um, you know, a, a certain kind of freedom that, that actually isn't there. And, and, and we could also look at um, Franz Fanon's work, you know, as a way of thinking about the limitations, I suppose, of, of a, a too neutral, a too naive image of existential freedom. You know, because the point is, you don't always get to define your project. You don't always get to define who you are. If you're constantly being positioned and treated in a certain way on the basis of sex and race, you don't get to have the same kind of freedom to determine yourself. You know, and that's the that's the point. So, I guess in a you know maybe in a more materialist, more limited sense, you know, it's not utopian in the same way um, as Spystone. But what would it mean to actually, you know, really have that kind of freedom? And it's almost like the freedom to be uncertain, <laughs> actually. It's the freedom to, to almost be, to fail and to be unhappy, um, in a way. And I'm quite interested in this. I'm very interested in a kind of feminism of, of failure <laughs> and kind of being rubbish. And I suppose you mentioned the, the, the book I wrote a long time ago. Um, when I was quite a lot younger. I mean, part of the reason I wrote that book was actually in response to, it's not really a book, it's like a pamphlet, um, in response to this kind of very, I found very irritating, positive narrative 
you know, of, of kind of mainstream feminism, where it's like, yay, everything's great, you know, empowerment, mm-hmm. yay, things are brilliant, you know, and, and you can see that reflected, I guess, in the kind of lean-in idea, or like the, you know, the corporate feminism idea that, you know, participation is wonderful. You, yes, you have to try a bit harder, but, you know, capitalism is great for women. And it's like, that's fucking not, it's awful. And so I'm quite interested in, yeah, this idea of not succeeding and what a feminism failure looks like. Anyway, okay, so I can imagine certain things about thinking about kind of feminist utopia and feminist future. What would it be like if traits that get associated with women, such as emotional and care, were not slandered and poorly paid, if paid at all, but aspirations for all humanity, such that to be associated with these qualities would be the greatest thing and a source of great pride, not in the negative sense. I can imagine a world where the male gaze is not the sole filter for the visual, where people are granted other qualities beyond their hotness or otherwise. I can imagine a world in which reparations are made for the way in which women have been treated, though what form this would take I cannot imagine, especially if we like more abolish money. But it's interesting to think back for, to something like the Wages for Housework campaign, where in a sense there is a kind of provocative and again a sort of wager, you know, saying, look, you know, we want reparations, we want to be paid in full, we want it now, we want all the, you know, all the money that we were never paid for all the work we did on the basis of, of gender, on the basis of this idea that you must do these things because you're a woman and women care and women love and, you know, this is women's role. And so there's something, again, very provocative about this call and this demand, actually, for, for reparations. And we can also think about this in, in relation to race as well. Um, but perhaps women should be paid back uh, you know, this is a kind of question. Um, and then how would we kind of get reparations for patriarchy? <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and so, yeah, I, I think a, a, a true feminist utopia, maybe a hertopia, would, would surely not have slaves or wars, um, but I think it would not be boring either. It would be rather constantly inventive. And I think one of the criticisms is always levelled at sort of some feminist utopias is like, but where's the innovation? Where's the yeah? Where's the drama? It's like you know, you're always accusing women of being dramatic, but you know, like wars, man. <laughs> it's like mad drama. Um, anyway, <laughs> of course we're making stuff. Um, yeah. So okay, just sorry, just finished. I'm talking too much, but um, the on this point of of time, I suppose what I want to say is, I've been thinking a lot in the past few years. And it's sort of related, it, it relates to kind of questions of patriarchy and the way men relate to one another, is through the state and through using time as a form of punishment. And if you think about, you know, prison in the most kind of basic sense, you know, what is it? Well, it's based on the idea that, you know, your life is finite and that someone else has the power to take away a chunk of your finite life um, away from you, you know, and it's, it's precisely predicated on a certain image of, of vulnerability in a way, but that's never kind of discussed in that way. You know, it's always discussed in terms of, of punishment, you know, that there is this power that punishes you for something that, that you have done. But but behind that is this, I think, very weaponized image of time. You know, and who has the capacity to, to control time? Well it's the state. You know, and I and I you know it's it's courts, it's waiting for a trial, it's being on bail, it's being in prison, it's being punished after that. It's also being held in like refugee centres, you know, where your where the sense of time is 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 something like a profound limbo, you know, where you you have no control over time, you have no kind of relation, you can't possibilize or have a relation to the future because your status is so uncertain, you know, both both spatially and temporally, you know, when you're being held for indefinite periods of time, and I think indefinite detention is kind of one of the core ideas we need to think about if we're going to have a politics of time now, what does it mean for people to be um, suspended um, by powers beyond their control, that, you know, powers that have the, the force of violence behind them. Um, so I suppose, yeah, if, if we're thinking about time as such, I would always want to begin from who has t- this question of who has time taken away from them, you know, and by who, you know, and I think only then can we proceed to, to speculate about more positive relations to time. So that's that's what I want to say. Yes, please. And then and then we talk. Mm. Okay. Um, yeah. So thanks.
for that, Nina. Yeah, that's a really hard trick. Sorry, it's a bit surreal. I've been awake, but I was like, I fell last night till really late. Yeah. And I'm really out of it. And it's kind of weird to do a talk in this Saturday morning. <laughs> it is early. It's early. It's early. It's early. But that's, um, yeah, but holding to, hold to time. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, sure. So, yeah, and thank you to the world um, for inviting me. It's lovely to speak um, with Nina. Um, so, what uh, I think probably I've been interested in the project um, to do is maybe talk a little bit more about the, the idea of linear and non linear history. Um, so I'm going to just say a little bit about that in relation to my research, which is looking at the idea of linear and non-linear history in relation to the history of feminism. Um, so I'm not a historian, so I'm not um, interested in kind of constructing historical narratives. What I'm interested in doing is looking at the kinds of temporal structures that exist <coughs> when historical narratives of feminism are constructed. Um, so I, I first, I think I can trace my interest in this um, back to a conversation I had um, quite a few years ago with a friend, um, and we were kind of catching up, you know, what are you doing? What are you doing with your life? And I was saying that I wanted to do a PhD in feminist philosophy, but I couldn't think of a specific topic. Um, and so she said, you know, well, what's, what's happening in feminism these days? Where's, where's feminism at? Um, which I found to be an impossible question. Um, to answer, and I didn't really know what it meant. You know, does it mean um, where is feminism today in comparison to where it's been in the past? Does it mean, you know, what has feminism kind of fulfilled the promises or goals that it's set for itself? And if that is what it means, how on earth would we be able to judge or measure that? Um, you know, is is feminism is there this kind of unified or essential or continuous thing called feminism that kind of persists through time. Um, so my answer to the last question was a resounding no. <laughs> so it seemed quite clear to me then that um, feminism needs to kind of conceive or represent its own history in non-linear terms. Um, but actually it doesn't usually do this. Um, so Usually, the most common way of thinking about the history of feminism is through a model of feminist waves. Um, so when, the, when I started thinking, you know, what, what does this wave metaphor, or wave narrative, um, what are the kind of temporal logics behind that? And on the face of it, you could say that the, ma- the wave metaphor feels quite promising for thinking about history in a non-linear way. But certainly when I think of the sea, I think of you know, multiple waves crashing and ebbing and flowing, you know, different waves kind of doing their, their own thing at the same time. So you could say that the metaphor of waves is quite conducive to thinking about um, the history of feminism in a non-linear way. But actually that's not usually how the metaphor is deployed. So ordinarily within the model of feminist waves, you have the first wave feminism that comes first, um, and is uh, committed to, um, or is kind of centred around campaigns for rights um, as a solution to gender-based oppression, um, and it's usually uh, used to denote feminist campaigns for suffrage. So, particularly in the late, um, in the nineteenth and early twentieth centuries, and um, then you have the second wave, which is associated with um, women's liberation movements. 60s and 70s and feminist feminisms that take a Marxist or radical approach. Then the third wave um, are supposed to start in the 1990s and is associated with a postmodern approach, so with a kind of embrace of pluralism, a rejection of grand theories of patriarchy and capitalism and so on. Um, some people do speak of um, a fourth wave or even a fifth wave of feminism. Um, I'm never quite sure what these are. Um, but I suppose the point is that whatever the detail of these kind of wave narratives and however many waves might be included, they consistently construct the history of feminism as a kind of singular, progressive, linear journey through time, past to present to future. And um, so what's wrong with this model? Or what's wrong with this kind of linear narrative of history? Um, 
quite a lot. <laughs> I'll just um, kind of make a couple of points. One is that um, I think it reproduces a kind of imperialist logic of history where particular historical trajectories or events are understood as somehow expressing or being part of a more general pattern. Um, and funnily enough, the general pattern um, here is based on the supposed trajectory of um, Western European and North American feminism. So in the wage model, um, it is um, a kind of very reductive and simplified um, version of Western, femini Western feminism, if you like, that's being kind of made to stand for feminism as a whole. And so there's a presumption that there's a kind of inevitable feminist logic being worked out in particular local instances. So the idea is that feminis feminisms everywhere have gone through the same kind of twists and turns, um, or if they haven't, that they kind of need to catch up or they'll get there eventually. Um, and so in this way, I think the wave model does reproduce this kind of imperialist, um, way of thinking about history um, and it also really fails to get to grips with the um, kind of shifting material realities in which different feminisms operate which <coughs> have very different theoretical approaches but also a very different set of principles and um, priorities and problems and so on um, so it's imperialist it's insufficiently materialist um, and I also think it uh, results in a kind of lazy historicism where we consistently uh, dismiss or don't take seriously particular kinds of feminism that we've kind of relegated to an outdated um, or bygone feminist past. Um, I think Marxist and radical feminist feminisms suffer particularly from this kind of treatment. So we often just presume that Marxist or radical feminisms will have nothing to say, nothing interesting to tell us in the present, because we presume so readily that they're kind of embarrassing and outdated. Um, I was thinking, actually, um, there's a comparison here with the way that you know, Jeremy Corbyn's politics is so easily dismissed as belonging to the 1970s. So rather than take, take his policies or his ideas seriously and think about what they might tell us or enable us to achieve in the present, we kind of, we don't even have to take them seriously or think through them properly because, you know, Do you they know. belong to the 70s, but <laughs> <laughs> um, not if, yeah, that's not what the Daily Mail wants us no. to think. Um, <laughs> but so it's this strategy, I think, of kind of relying on the temporal structure of the stories we tell ourselves about the past rather than looking at the arguments themselves. So I think the quality of feminist argument is really impoverished by this kind of linear model of history that we continually reproduce when we tell ourselves stories about feminism and where it's been and where it's going and so on. Um, so in response to these kind of problems, uh, a lot of feminists have actually been calling for non-linear conceptions of feminism, non-linear representations of feminist history. Um, as a way, I suppose, to be able to better recognise the kind of multiple lines of history and time that operate in the present, um, but also to forge a more, um, I hate using the word productive, but a <laughs> constructive um, relation to the past. So rather than presume that the past is necessarily something that needs to be transcended or kind of moved away from, um, you know, perhaps having a more hopeful relation to the past where we might be able to turn to the past in order, in order to inspire a more radical <coughs> political imagination in the present. Um, so this is a, an idea of a kind of looping back to move forward. And then I was also thinking of what you just said, what Nina just said, which I think is really important about we also need to be very careful not to overemphasize the moving forward and the kind of positivity. And so I think, you know, we might, it might not necessarily be about looping back to move forward, but it might be about enabling ourselves to fail. <laughs> um, 
Oh, I like to say, do you know, <laughs> a freedom to be unhappy <laughs> or to fail or to just kind of be a bit uncertain and rubbish. <laughs> and I think that that's quite important. And I think projection. That <laughs> I'd like that freedom as well. Um, but I think that if we stop thinking about history as necessarily a movement forwards all the time, you know, it might be a movement backwards. But that's not necessarily such a bad thing. Mm-hmm. You know, we should be able to dwell in the past a little bit well in the present as well. I don't think we need to think of feminism so much as this kind of relentless mm-hmm. move forward. And I think thinking it, thinking about it in those kind of terms is actually quite depressing and debilitating. So I think there can be something, you know, almost quite glorious about refusing the future or refusing to think in terms of forwardness. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think I'm going to stop there. I think you um, you also said before um, something about the importance of this being a kind of interdisciplinary project Mm -hmm. and I really really think that that's true because I mean certainly when I started first started thinking about these ideas I was based in quite a traditional um, philosophy department I don't know if anybody knows what they're like in the UK (laughs) but they're quite terrifying places and you start you know using terms like non-linear history you meet a lot of Skepticism and raised eyebrows, and you know, old men with the leather, you know, old road pads, kind of saying, What are you talking about? You know, this is against the laws of physics, and so on. Um, and so, I think for me, it, it became quite important to um, get a kind of conceptual clarity of what, what did it mean to talk about non linear history. Um, and so, I found a lot of resources in um, phenomenology. And I'm, I'm not going to talk, I was going to talk about phenomenology, but I'm not going to because I think it's too boring um, <laughs> for a nice art space like this. Um, but, you know, when I then kind of met um, people who were working on similar ideas but from totally different disciplines, they weren't so hung up on the kind of conceptual questions that I was. You know, and they were saying, you know, for example, in literature, of course, time is not living, right? You know, you're always kind of flashing backwards and flashing forwards and moving around and of course time isn't linear. You know, it d- didn't feel like such a kind of controversial project in a way, or if you, people from film studies or from art, you know, there's so many resources. Or we were talking before about um, psychoanalysis, but you know, in psychoanalysis there's this whole idea that the past kind of catch up catches up with us after the event. And you know of course But also that the unconscious has no time yeah. in history, you know, things are out of order, mm. you know, there is, there's just this kind of jungle in a sense. Yes, yeah, so there's not that kind of foundational, uh, or this presupposition of a kind of historical foundation that's always kind of moving yeah. forward, you know, one event serially after the other. Mm. And so I think, you know, if we look through all kind of humanities, social sciences, the arts, so many resources for thinking about the history of non-linear, and yet there is this kind of persistent common sense idea that one thing happens after the other, and that history does move kind of inexorably forwards. You know, my students always have this presupposition of progress. You know, even despite all of the <laughs> evidence to the contrary, there's still this kind of faith in progress. So I think, yeah, I think part of the challenge is to kind of work with the resources you have in whatever field you're in. But I also think there's something recalcitrant about the idea of um, linear history. And I think there's so much investment in that. And so I, I think we also need to kind of think about the politics behind the kind of continual investment in this idea of, of progress in linear history. Mm-hmm. So I think I'll stop there. Mm-hmm. And maybe we can all, <laughs> all say things. Great. That reminds me, there's an a, a Argentina, the sort of notion of sort of anti-progress or um, after the crash, they horizontalism, um, this sort of almost uh, non-hierarchical sideways, mm-hmm. thing. we have the resources, we have everything here to sort of to halt progress for a while and actually just sort of live in, mm-hmm. uh, be mindful that you know, live in the time that we're actually in with the resources that we have. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean I think there's something that we also have to, well, I completely agree with what, what Victoria is saying, and that at the same time we also have this kind of fetishization novelty, you know, ideas always have to be new, there always has to be some, 
you know, and, 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 and even if we think about kind of revolution or something, you know, there is a kind of fetishization of something happening, you know, something uh, completely unexpected, mm -hmm. you know, emerging, you know, but actually, I mean, the, the more interesting question, the more important question, I think, especially perhaps thinking about, you know, the resources of feminism is, you know, do the arguments still work? You know, are the concepts still relevant? You know, does patriarchy explain something? If not, you know, we move on with it, you know, but actually the arguments that, that people were having in 1915 or 1970, you know, if, they, if they're still relevant, well, what, you know, then they're relevant. Do you know what I mean? Like, I think this idea that we always have to forget about the past, you know, but actually when you go back and read these texts, you know, they're actually far more like trenchant and pertinent, you know, than we think, you know, this idea, this kind of arrogance of the present, mm. you know, where we think, oh, well, you know, of We've course, solved all the problems. of course, this <laughs> is no problem. You know, it's, it's ridiculous. I mean, you know, it, it's, it does a disservice to the history of thought. You know, if we think about, you know, the history of human thought as a, as a kind of resource in that a sort of general intellect, you know, of, of the species, you're very Marxist way of putting it, but, you know, <laughs> actually, you know, uh, Things don't change that bloody much, you know. <laughs> Actually, for all the you know newness and whatnot, you know the, the problems are, are pretty much the same. Some of the suggestions about how we might analyse them are quite similar, you know. That's why I think it's interesting to go back to to more, you know, and, and, and you know things that are written a very long time ago and mm -hmm. think, well, what's here, you know, what's what can we use, what can we think about, and yeah. So I kind of want want to critique. This sort of federalization of novelty and the, and the arrogance of the present, as I'm, I'm putting it. And, and I think, you know, if we ask, do the arguments still work? Well, actually, if we're thinking about the question of time, so something like social reproduction theory, you know, the idea that actually, you know, what gets reproduced every day is the entirety of the social and all of the unpaid work that goes into that. You know, what does it mean to actually, you know, reproduce the world in its entirety every day, you know, to, to ensure that people are fed, well, you know, are able to sell their labour power, you know, that, that, that people are washed and clothed and, and all these things, you know, the actual, the amount of labour that goes into constructing every day, you know, and that's an image of time, mm. you know, and how do we reproduce what we want to re reproduce without reproducing the negative things, you know, I mean, you know, sexism and racism are reproduced all the time, for example, you know, how do we reproduce ourselves without reproducing, you know, capital or all these these other mm. negative things, and that, like, that's a that's a really interesting problem for politics of time. I think, you know, because because we're doing it all the time anyway, right? Mm. So we can't escape the, that logic. Um, but I think if we pose the question, if we can see what we're doing in that sense, you know, the <coughs> work of care, the work of reproducing ourselves and others, is an immense labour. Is you know, is what keeps the world going, mm. actually. Um, then we have a kind of different model of time, not quite cyclical, but you know, it's uh, kind of revolutions and then yeah. small, smaller <laughs> sets. <laughs> Maybe big, big I, I think that the concept of reproduction is really important. Yeah. And I was thinking about it when you were saying, talking about Firestone. Um, so this okay. idea, of, um, or in the dialectic of sex, that Firestone has. So she's writing at a time where. You know, the first test tube babies are just yeah. around the corner, and so it's this kind of... 1978, yeah. Yeah, it's this time where... Um, she was writing in 70, but 78 was the first yeah. test tube Yeah, so she's kind of looking ahead, and, and so there is that kind of sense of Absolutely. possibility of what could, um, what could te technology kind of bring, but particularly around the organisation of reproduction. Um, mm -hmm. And I think... You know, her, her thesis is so crude that, you know, actually, <laughs> the kind of, she kind of weirdly thinks that all um, oppressive, relate, oppressive human relations can be somehow kind of traced back to the kind of ultimate injustice, which is the female kind of role in reproduction. And you, you find kind of traces of that thinking a bit in De Beauvoir, actually, as well, mm -hmm. I think. Um, but in a way, I think this is quite interesting because. So they're telling kind of story, you know, big, big stories about the history of human injustice and oppression. But I think also this idea of um, kind of reproduction, the organisation of reproduction kind of being at the heart of, of human relations, mm -hmm. is also very present in utopian visions where so often they're so, you know, it's such a conservative genre because often yeah. what happens 
is the imagination is you know, usually there's some kind of fertility um, <laughs> problem <laughs> or it's you know like there's there'll be for some reason loads more men in existence than women and so suddenly women are kind of once again reduced to this role so it's kind of there'll often be a device where it's like looking back to you know times before this women you know there were all these kind of different ways that um, human beings can relate to one another but now we have the kind of fundamental question of how to reproduce ourselves and suddenly yeah there's a very conservative and traditional organization of gender again yeah um, or it's kind of buried and hidden just mm-hmm. as it is now, in a way, yeah. you know, it's like that which we may not speak of, but mm. which subtends everything yeah. else. And so, I think, and I, I was just thinking about this. I've been watching the um, adaptation of The Hamlet's Tale, um, and it's because this is a dystopian projection. But you know, again, it is um, well, maybe not for everybody. But for me, it's dystopian. <laughs> um, you know, again, it's women, or well, certainly The Hamlet's are fertile, but maybe kind of produced. Um, to their role of reproduction. And I think it, you know, and in a way, it obviously performs a kind of critical function, you know, it makes us look at the present and so on. But, you know, I, in a way it's so depressing to see that it's being played out again, you know, however differently it's valued. And so I, I'm really interested, I think, and this is why I think theatre disciplinary thing really comes in, okay? mm. you know, I just want to read a lot more feminist utopian literature yeah. to see actually even if we think that there is an eff- infertility epidemic as mm. in the future, you know, how how might we resist that kind of return to mm. um, organisation, reproduction where women are just reduced to a kind of childbearing function. Yeah. So I think it's I'd welcome any good things yeah. that people have read about that. I what they doesn't mention is um, the infertility of the men. Yeah. And that was pretty sad, was written mm. quite a long time ago, so it's strange that they probably don't have any now. But um, I think the fertility of the men is an issue in it as well, which is sort of one not really mm. mentioned. Yeah, so you masculinity imagine, still functions as it, yeah. as it did and before. That, I mean, so it's not really, it's not really about fertility. Um, yeah. No. Mm. This book, uh, and somebody's recommendation last year, it's um, written by two evolutionary biologists called Sex at Dawn. Have you come across it? I mean, I haven't really had a chance to kind of really it's a great, a great read <laughs> over a holiday, but um, it was arguing uh, by looking at our closest evolutionary um, comparatives to chimpanzees and bonobos that. Um, specifically around this issue of reproduction and it being something that's um, uh, controlled <coughs> in human society. It's arguing that if you, if, you, if you flip it over and say that the woman instead has all of the power because she has multiple partners and thus you change the relationship between men and women, in that regard, the men are competing for her favor and there's um, the kind of model of thought around the kind of monogamous relationship being that the, the woman has to be subject to the male because the males it's, it's based on the evolutionary conceit that the that the male needs one partner to um, you know to, to reproduce his his uh, his his genes. Anyway, it's linked in a really interesting way to the relationship between um, nomadic versus sort of settled societies and those the writers of Link it historically to the moment when people started to settle down and, and be linked to farming. And I don't know where this goes, but it feels uh, um, connected up to capitalism in interesting ways. And capitalism, um, you know, needs uh, needs uh, sort of settled and organized and um, you know uh, uh, instrumentalized societies. It, it, it's really interesting to think about the, the role that women play within. Mm-hmm. Within that, so I feel was, there was something really interesting. I thought developing across your two talks, maybe Nina and you talking about um, what was it? Because I was thinking about growth, the the capitalism's dependence on growth, and maybe there being something that one could relate to women's um, the of care. Mm-hmm. So, because in a way, 
capitalism defers um, care, whether it's to individuals or to the planet and so on, yeah, into, totally. the, into the future. So, you know, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm very interested in actually what it would mean to start with care, actually, mm -hmm. as, you know, because I think, in a sense, care <coughs> as, a, as a value in the, in the general sense of value, as opposed to value in the sense of profit, yeah. you know, because, yeah. cause of course, I mean, care is absolutely, you know, fundamental to everything, but it's that which is kind of hidden, buried, mm -hmm. um, treated very badly, it's, it's gendered and racialised in specific ways, it's, it's barely paid or, you know, unpaid or very badly paid. Um, and yet, you know, because in a sense, if we start with care, it's acknowledgement that actually, for most of our lives, we're not autonomous, rational, uh, you know, kind of profit-seeking beings, but actually vulnerable, dependent beings who are always in relation, you know, and our entire existence depends on, you know, vulnerability, uh, in fact. And, you know, actually, if you start with that, then it changes two things that are very important to my mind, one of which is, particularly relates to kind of current debates around automation, and this idea of automating work, you know, that, that argument can only really proceed, it seems to me, if you have a very, like, already mechanised image of what work is, because you can't automate lots of things. I mean, of course you can, uh, you know, pretend to, you can you think about care robots, you know, I mean, these things exist, you can think about sex robots, I mean, actually, I'm in favour of sex mm -hmm. robots, because I think people won't have to sell, sell, sell sex, but, you know, but, but actually, you know, there's kind of intimate, bodily, personal relations, physical relations, I think we're not yet prepared, and I think there are huge ethical questions about this, to, to automate those, you know, and that actually to, to think that automation is the solution to the problem of work, the problem of labour, is to start from the wrong place. Um, and the second kind of major point about care is it also changes how we might think about striking and how we might think about refusing, because it's very different, like laying down tools and, and, and sabotaging machines and leaving factories in the kind of classical sense than it is to go on a care strike because a care strike is, you know, about life, it is about vulnerability, you know, you can't leave your baby, you know, unattended and, and say, I don't really care, but, <laughs> <laughs> you want to. but you know what I mean, it's a very different question and then that changes how we might think about politics as well, you know, and I'm, I'm very interested in these forms of um, strike that like the sex strike and you know this is just a very old idea you know there was the Ice, uh, Icelandic women's strike where all the women went on strike every single day and actually to to change pain conditions in the back 1974 I think in a <coughs> I'm very interested in a uh, smile strike kind of Feinstein and others proposal that women should stop smiling whenever men make shit jokes you know <laughs> <laughs> and, um, <laughs> And so the artist um, Claire Fontaine, uh, it's a collective, um, you talk about the human strike, you know, what it means to actually go, go on strike from our human capacities, you know, if all labour is increasingly kind of based around our capacity to be human, to be not, you know, to sell our, our souls and ourselves, if you like, you know, what it means to actually refuse that work. So there's a kind of big question about, yeah, everything changes when you put care in the middle, it's a really <coughs> fundamental thing, I'm very interested in that. Actually, and that's sort of, you know these kind of speculative history yeah. of humanity would change drastically. If you did. Yeah, no, totally. Sorry. If you did put care in the middle, mm. but that's um, I really like a book um, by a feminist philosopher called Christine Battersby, and she oh, yeah. kind of says, you know, how, what would the history of, well, no, she, it's not. She's kind of says what you know what would philosophy look like if instead of the male subject, it was a female subject with the kind of potential capacity to work. Mm -hmm. And how would that change our whole ideas about space and time and embodiment and rationality and relationships? And I think, yes, yeah, so it, it could, it's a similar project in a way, isn't it? Where you wouldn't, it wouldn't necessarily be a female subject at the centre because there are potential problems with that. Um, but yeah, it would just be a care, a care <coughs> actually, at the centre. Um, but just, just one thing I um, uh, related to what you said is that I think we always need to be quite careful about drawing on perspectives from evolutionary biology. Yeah. I'm very suspicious of evolutionary biology. You know, we remember that they're <coughs> stories, but they do such um, such political work yeah. in the mm -hmm. present. You know, you think about and again it often is used to shore up a very kind of conservative 
organisation of gender. But they're both really cool. <laughs> they're this, both are pretty cool. This book attacked um, the way they were claiming that like Jane Goodall's research into chimpanzees has been like hugely distorted, and it was based on um, a really uh, well. Obviously, she was studying for a long time, but it was like an so interesting. So they really they went back into her her methodology, and it was quite it was quite convincing. Mm -hmm. But humans are weird because they are kind of oddly positioned between the aggression of chimpanzees and the affection of bonobos. Like it's almost like a kind yeah. of <laughs> choice. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, yeah, what, what kind of um, connections you make or emphasise depends on what you want to say. Exactly. <laughs> but I was thinking because um, I I had a baby about a year ago, and um, what I've really found quickly people draw on evolutionary biology <laughs> to make just such a <laughs> in general conversation. Yeah, so I mean it all doesn't hit like his dad. Mm -hmm. And then oh, yeah. um, so many people will then say, and that's because um, you know, because yeah. it's yeah, because yeah, yeah. it's a way that nature has of telling us who the father is. Mm -hmm. So it's the people really say that. Mm -hmm. so <laughs> much, so often <laughs> strangers as well. <laughs> but it's <laughs> We go so quickly to yeah. biological narratives to try and shore up a particular idea. You know, in this yeah. sense, this idea of a kind of patriarchal ownership of the child. Yeah, yeah. yeah. People seem to be really invested in it. I didn't realise we were so invested in it, but it seems that we are. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it's interesting. I mean, in, in philosophy and you know, feminism, there is a surging interest, actually, in biology um, and what kind, what biologists might have the kind of interesting things they might have to tell us about the human condition and remembering that we are animals and we are kind of biological beings. But it's always just feels like a slightly risky thing to do mm. because the minute that you try and root feminism in a kind of natural science, I think, you're, you're kind of you're fixing a foundation in a way. And then you say, what if the science changes to yeah, then course, change yeah. our kind of theories about social relationships. Yeah. So I think it's kind of interesting, it's so inspiring and then it also feels dangerous as well. So I'm not quite sure. But it's 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 a very difficult question because I mean if you think about the kind of wars over sex and gender, you know, mm. actually, you know, what happens if you say that both sex and gender are constructs? Mm. You know, then you've got you know, a kind of issue about them where we can't talk about oppression on the basis of biology, we can't you know do you see what I mean? Like, so there's a kind of maybe strategic essentialism, I guess, with yeah. the, the way it was discussed, you know, a few decades ago. And you know, it's a very difficult question because, it, again, you know, like the Beauvoir's point about, you know, you, since you can't choose how you're treated, you may want to, you know, think of yourself as some kind of, you know, ether-like spirit, you know, sort of drifting around the world. But actually, if you're kind of constantly interpolated and treated in a particular way, then you know, you don't, you don't have a choice about that. And so you're constrained by that, and then it's kind of what you do within that framework. Mm. So very, like, very tricky. So I, I mean, I agree with the critique of obviously, you know, sort of blunt, you know, poor uses, and they are always ideological implications mm. of genetics or selfishness or whatever. And in a sense, you know, those theories of, of selfishness and possession, in a sense, probably make more sense to trace it back to economic structure than they do to scientific mm. development, you know, and they're often invoked then, they kind of reinforce themselves, you know, so like the selfish gene went along very well with Thatcher, Thatcher right and Mitchellism, yeah. you know, there's total, you know, kind of mirroring and echo, um, you know, and I think you've got this question of possession, you remind me there's this phrase in some languages where when you kind of uh, speak to a woman, a man speaks to a woman, they don't say who are you, they say whose are you, <laughs> as in like, who do you belong to, you know, who's your husband or who's your father? You know, and that kind of idea of being kind of, you know, open, being being a possession, being something to be exchanged between men. You know, so it's not the handmaid tale, isn't it? Yeah, the handmaids are named after the commander, um, and she actually said, I think Margaret Atwood, that everything in the book is based on an example she found yeah. from real life research. So there's there's nothing in that book that hasn't happened. Yeah. So again, that's interesting, isn't it? So kind of drawing on history to project a vision of the present, just to bring it back to <laughs> nonlinear history. <laughs> um, but yeah, drawing on kind of terrifying examples of the history to project a dystopian vision, rather than necessarily inspiring 
mm-hmm. examples to construct a kind of utopia. I was wondering, um, thinking about uh, fertility and the mainly negative projections we have about control of fertility, mm-hmm. um, whether, and I, whether you've thought about looking into one of the biggest controlled policies of fertility, which is China, mm-hmm. and the one-child policy. They've it's, got rid of that there, though. Yeah, they've just got rid of it. But only in the point of view is that all my presupposed ideas of what this actually meant to people when I went there, I've been there a couple of times, and I'm no expert, so I'm just positing this as something that might be worth looking at. The only thing I'd heard about were the, the cruelty, were the you know, sort of obvious how we would feel about being controlled. But what I wasn't prepared for was how positive a lot of women were about it, mm-hmm. about this idea, and how it seemed to have allowed for a freedom that a lot of, certainly when I had children, I, was, I had children, sort of a number of children, and certainly that felt like that was holding me back in many ways. How a lot of women talked about it as <coughs> a freedom, mm. and they wouldn't want more than one child, and what would you do if you had more children you couldn't do, what, you know, in terms of work? And, mm. Well, I'm not saying that's right or wrong, but my, certainly my expectations were confounded. Mm. By, and I was actually talking to urban women, so I wasn't talking to women in the country where I'm sure the experience would be very different. But again, it might be worth looking a little further about there's a very controlled experiment mm. and how that was perceived by the people who were being controlled. Mm. I, mean, I, think that, I think that's exactly right, isn't it, in a way that we, um, we kind of have our presumptions and actually you know, the right thing to do is listen to the women that are kind of mostly affected or might even be directing these kind of things. And but also there will be no one answer. Well, yeah, as right. you so say, you know, there, there, and within I know certainly yeah. instances of women who have defied it and have suffered, they don't mm. suffer punishment as such, but they suffer in ways, mm. uh, deprivations of education mm. of the second child, of medical care of the second child. So these are very subtle ways of controlling. Um, but nevertheless, great pain is, mm-hmm. is inflicted. So it's no, there is no, as you say, no linear answer to any of it. It's, but it is interesting to hear voices that I didn't expect to hear. Mm. You know, I think that's really important. And just to also think about, um, so when we think about the politics of reproduction, often from a um, particular um, kind of privileged white Western perspective, it often revolves around you know, the freedom not to have children and actually you know if you look at forced sterilization programs for example often the politics of reproduction from a feminist perspective have been actually a kind of fight for, to have to be able to have children and so yeah I think we it, I think place really matters but also again not necessarily approaching these um, situations with a preconceived idea of what you know, what, what's right or wrong or how it will affect women because often we don't, we don't know. Anyone else have any questions? No. Um, that was uh, an extraordinary talk. Thank mm-hmm. you. Um, lots and lots to think about. Quite, well, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, this is my lecture. Um, <laughs> Um, uh, a lot to think about. Um, we will be sharing it online. Um, possibly, um, our concerns, if you could leave your emails, we have gone through a member right, but if not leave them, we can share it because uh, we can kind of recap. And there's lots of things I'd like to read up and follow. Um, that was uh, great. Thank you very much. Thanks for being here.